we think about this problem, and I guess the wide ranging set of, of challenges would be more accurate, um, I think that ends up having pretty far ranging consequences. Uh, Nicole, I know you've thought a lot about the academic and career implications of all this, but anything that you would add as we sort of size up some of the challenges here? Yeah, I, I definitely want to emphasize the the point that Adam made of like the inhibition of the actual impact of science and the public accessibility of science. It's something that I think is a major flaw. And it's something that I think more of the transparent practices and preprints and you know other solutions we'll get into later are working to help. Um, and I'll just add two kind of points that uh, I think about in terms of the major problems with the system as it is right now is one, I feel like it's too slow um, to actually advance science in the way that we need it to, especially in high stake circumstances. Um, so the COVID pandemic was a great example of this. Um, and this is something I wrote about actually in a blog for HXA. There are you know, the, we saw researchers like bypassing the traditional publishing system to get research and data out faster. So other scientists and the public could actually understand what was going on. Um, so, you know, preprints were like the star of the show for the first, you know, six months. Um, and even with like these advanced peer review and journal practices, papers were still taking more than two months to actually go through the process. And if we didn't have these other systems in place that allowed scientists to actually get work out, we'd be waiting two months to find information that could have been known two months sooner, which during a global pandemic is obviously very useful. Um, so I think the system's very slow. Um, since then, obviously, I think every academic who's watching this will attest to how slow the peer review process has gotten <laughs> in recent months where people are waiting like sometimes years <laughs> for papers to get out. Um, so I just think the the system's too slow for what we have now. And we have technology in place to make the system much more efficient and actually getting knowledge out there to both the public and other researchers. Um, and then second, I'll just hit on the point of like publications have become so central to an academic's career, especially if you're on the tenure track at you know, a research oriented university or in a research oriented position. The just the, the idea of a publication has become so central and has created such this, you know, kind of skewed incentive structure that the focus is just getting publications in the right journals um, kind of as fast as possible. So you can get, you know, advance um, through kind of the tenure track um, when the goal of science should be discovery and inquiry and, you know, solving problems and discovering new things. But the goal now is just to get publications in the best journals or the right journals for your field. So I think the publishing system has become like its own beast within academia um, that's not necessarily aligned with the goals of science or scholarship more generally. Thank you. Um, I'm pleased to see so many comments already in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, I'll throw an extra prompt out there in case anyone wants to take it up in the chat. So um, we, uh, we, we sometimes uh, end up with a bunch of psychologists on a panel at HXA, and that's what we've done today. <laughs> if you're not in this particular part of science, whether you're in, in astrophysics or or philosophy or music theory or, or law, where the students are the ones who run the journal, um, please chime in and let us know uh, how this applies or might be a little different in your corner of academia. Um, okay, so we've talked about a really wide ranging set of challenges that are kind of intersecting and, and slowing down this kind of ideal search for truth that, that we, were, we were hoping to have. What can be done about it? I, I saw one comment in the chat from one of our members saying, well, maybe there's a way to uh, sort of pre-publish your, your research plans, uh, and then maybe the results will fall as they may, but the, the review incentives will be a little bit better aligned. Maybe I can go back to you, David. The, the center where you work has done so much good uh, work thinking about new tools to advance this. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, and um, if I could be so bold as to use Adams, if I can use your analogy, um, uh, you know, the, the ecosystem, uh, what we see in the published literature is uh, kind of a monoculture of, of mammals. Um, and the mammals that we would say um, that litter the ecosystem are sort of surprising, uh, statistically significant findings. Um, and so confirmatory research or research that presents null or negative findings um, is 
is is um, largely absent. Um, estimates vary, but a lot of estimates are centered around less than five percent of the of the literature. Um, you know, doesn't support the hypothesis that the authors laid out. Um, and what that implies is either that everyone doing all this work um, has perfect prediction powers to uh, to know the future, which is not likely, um, or that we're testing extraordinarily boring work and, and just can um, know what's going to happen. And we don't think that's happening either. Um, but what we see a lot of is that incentive to get those statistically significant um, surprising findings. There are unfortunate means to, 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 to achieve that. So there's a lot of different ways to torture a data set to kind of tell it something that um, one thinks might be most likely to get into cell nature of science, um, as was mentioned before. Just the, 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 the types of journals that, um, uh, or, and this happens in many journals, of course, not to pick on the big three, um, but the types of results that are most surprising and would make the biggest headlines. Um, but what you alluded to, Michael, is a, a process of uh, pre-specification, sort of setting up the test ahead of time um, and subjecting that to peer review. And so, uh, you know, coming up with a good research question is the, the, the most important um, first step. Finding out the best way to put that to a very rigorous test um, is, is, is the next most important step. And, and that's where um, there are a lot of biases that can occur. If you're using a data set that you've collected um, after an experiment um, uh, throughout that process, it, it can come to all sorts of different results. And so setting that up before you see what the results are precisely gonna be can be the best way to make sure that that's being put to a fair test. And bringing peer reviewers into that process um, it, uh, it really shifts the conversation. Um, you know, I, I was monitoring some of the chat um, and complaining about peer reviewers is probably uh, what academics love to do most, me included. Um, um, and it's because setting that up at the end um, really sets us up for, for critique. And, and critique is, of course, important. Uh, but if that's the only opportunity that there is for um, dialogue, then it becomes almost guaranteed to be a, an exercise and gatekeeping, find, finding flaws especially if it doesn't confirm with what you um, expected to say, it's easy to criticize after um, you know, seeing how the, the chips fell. So the workflow known as registered reports um, sort of flips it on its head. The importance of the research question and the ability of the proposed methods to address that question fairly and setting up fair goalposts. So a lot of uh, self-doubt or, or review criticism can occur. If you see null results, you could think, oh, I just didn't do it right. Reviewers um, will point out, oh, it just didn't um, work because of course you are incompetent. I wouldn't say it quite that way, but some reviewers might. Mm -hmm. um, but setting up those goalposts ahead of time so that we know that it's a fair test. And there can even be uh, what's known as those adversarial collaboration where proponents of different theories um, can sort of set a fair test for, for both of them simultaneously. Um, and as long as those uh, types of tests are set up before data are collected or before the data are accessed, or, or at least before results are known, um, there can be a, um, a, a, a way to overcome a lot of those types of biases. And these register reports have been around in different formats for many years, but um, a big push in the last 10 years, especially among the social sciences, has um, start to see that that publication bias has been dramatically reduced among um, articles that use that type of format. We've heard.